Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to a set of introductory comments for the cluster Noon to Starry Night. There are 22 poems in this cluster. We only have four clusters now remaining in Leaves of Grass and those four clusters comprise the final 128 poems of Leaves of Grass. Now, we're going to go through a few assumptions here in our set of introductory comments. Our assumptions, of course, are that you've been working with us at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt, our playlist, from the very introductory word, come, all the way up to, and I'm hoping, concluding with Pomenock Picture, the text that we just finished with. Now, the, the uh, point here that we're always reminding ourselves right at the beginning is that we are the stories that we tell and retell. Of course, we're also the stories that we decide to accept or to reject. And to that degree, our learning theory is central. We're always trying to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. That is to say, the new is the new. And we learned this from our study of Whitman's Leaves of Grass. The new, N-E-W, is the new, K-N-E-W. In other words, Ideas are somewhat cyclical, and we're going to see that, in fact, in this very cluster itself, that we'll have that sense of we're coming to the end of Leaves of Grass, and so we're going to begin to see some attempt to try to bring the circle to its full close. Now, our annotative approach, just to remind you, we'll always try to ask three guiding questions. What does the text we're studying say? What does it mean? And how does it relate? Or how can I relate to it? That We're going to break the levels two and three up, so let's go through them. At level one, what does the text say? We're just summarizing, okay, what exactly is it that Whitman is saying in the poem. At 2A, we'll ask themes and messages, and at 2B, that's our rhetoric level. That is to say, literary analyses. In other words, not what Whitman says, but how Whitman says it, and we're going to be paying a lot of attention there. At 3A, we'll ask, how, how does this text relate to other texts I'm familiar with? Now, guys, at this point, if you've been reading with me all the way through Leaves of Grass, then you're going to hear a whole bunch of what we call echoes. In other words, you will be reading poems and you'll say, that reminds me of, and then you'll go back. Obviously, we'll also ask about other texts that we are familiar with, not just that we've read, but also what we've viewed, what we've listened to, and even for the gamers in the house, what we play. And then finally, at 3B, most importantly, we call it, how can we own the text? We're going to try to relate something of the text back to ourself or our time or our world. Now, of course, we'll always remind ourselves about any given text we're studying in 303 that we have what we call our big five. In other words, we're always looking to ask about any text we study. How does this text speak to our understanding of epistemology, what you can know, right? Now, of course, there are are three kind of views of epistemological uh, understanding. One is, of course, the absolutist position. What I know is right, and if you don't agree with me, you're wrong. The absolutist position. But as we pointed out often, this is kind of what can lead to lots of tragedy. Think about, for example, the American Civil War and the absolutist epistemological positions which led to both sides deciding they had to fight over it. Whitman has a lot to say even in this cluster about that. The complete opposite of that is, of course, what we will call the relativist position. Um, there is no absolute. There are no truths of any kind. The relativist position in an extreme version, of course, will be broken up by what we call the performative contradiction. In other words, to say there are no absolutes is to posit an absolute. To say there is no truth is to posit a truth. To say there is no mind is to obviously have to have a mind to argue. And to that degree, we find ourselves in Whitman's position in the center of the epistemological spectrum, what we call the fallibilist position. About that we mean simply, I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. It's that I could be wrong, that perhaps, that Whitman loves, that is always going to be at play. The other uh, of, the, of the two pairings, the other is uh, ontology. What does the text say about ontology? That is to say, who are we? Whitman is always playing this game of that juxtaposition of the body as well as the soul, spirit, consciousness, and the ways in which those two will dance against and for each other. It's the ontological position. The other two pairings, psychology and sociology, psychology the study of the individual mind, sociology the study of the collective mind, we're talking now about motivations. We're talking about how we come to terms with things like fears and that kind of thing. And then finally, the last of our big five, and I've made the argument that so much of Leaves of Grass is in fact the theodicy. That is to say, why must we have pain and suffering in the world? Why can't we just live in a world where there's no pain and no suffering? And obviously the ultimate pain and suffering is death. Well, Whitman is going to have a lot to say about this. Again, his primary theodicy is no longer ask why is this happening, 
to us, but rather why is this happening for us? And we're going to see that game being played out as well with the 22 poems of this cluster from noon to starry night. Now we've talked about Whitman, but truly, really, there are multiple Whitmans. We concentrate on five, although to be honest, it's really been six if you want to think about Whitman as, P, as priest or prophet. But for sure, our, big, our five of, of the P's or perspectives on Whitman is to see Whitman as person. He has a biography, for example. When he puts together his final deathbed edition, he puts Noon to Starry Night here as the first of the four final clusters. There's going to be a lot about aging and the process of coming to the end. And yet some of the poems in this cluster will be some of the earliest poems that Whitman wrote. Of course, Whitman is poet, no question, although it's interesting that Whitman didn't start out as a poet, which is why our third P is Whitman as pedagogue or teacher. Whitman started out as a teacher, and as we've said in our comments of Song of Myself 46, 47, and in a number of other places, I believe that the only way you can really read Leaves of Grass is to see it as an opportunity for Whitman to continue to be an educator, even though he's not in the classroom. Of course, Whitman is deeply concerned about political issues, so Whitman is politician in his celebration of democracy. We're going to see a lot of that here as well in this cluster. And then finally, and many see this as one of the more intriguing ways to read Lisa Grass, Whitman is philosopher. Everything from Socrates to Emerson and Hegel, he's going to be heavily influenced by philosophic thought, and of course we can think of the theological thought that is as well a part of this. Now, the best approach is to hopefully read it on your own. So you should have your own copy. I'm hopeful that you have your own copy of the Deathbed Edition of Leaves of Grass. Read these poems on your own, annotate them on your own, and then come to our comments and observations uh, as, as a way to maybe help amplify what you already know. Some of you will pick up, of course, these poems, and these will be the first poems of Leaves of Grass that you will read, and then you'll go back and begin to uh, read again. It's fun the way that Whitman invites you to read all of Deathbed Edition by reading one poem out of Deathbed Edition. Now, we have always referenced our Nortons to give us background information, and there's quite a bit of information here for the cluster of from noon to starry night. Norton says the following. It's difficult to find an unmistakable unifying principle in this cluster. I'm, I'm going to argue a little bit against that, and, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Which is new, this cluster, which is new to the final 1881 arrangement of Leaves of Grass. And one may sensibly conclude that the poet had none in mind. I'm going to argue a little bit against that, but we'll get to it. It's a miscellany, both in source and theme. It's 22 poems being brought together from seven different editions, 1855 to 1881. Here is the 1855 Faces, a poem so salient that one wonders why Whitman did not give it a place to itself in the final arrangement, as he did to 25 other poems. Here also is the 1856 Alexor, a sort of confident catechism, whose position has often shifted in the editions. Here are six brief poems of inscriptive intent from the third edition and four from the drum taps group. Nearly half of the poems are late arrivals. Five, in fact, are new to the 1881 edition. However, lacking in unity of theme or period of creation, the group as a whole is prevailingly reflective or retrospective, and we'll definitely want to write that down for sure and characterized by lyric power and truth, no doubt about it. In fact, some readers find some of the poems here some of their favorite of all of Leaves of Grass. At times, the lyric satisfaction is only sporadic in a poem, as in the beginning of Thou Orb Aloft, or the end of All is Truth. In the most noteworthy examples, chiefly shorter poems, the lyric propriety here is notably sustained, as in To a Locomotive in Winter, Manhattan, spirit that formed this scene and by broad Potomac's shore. Fittingly, the poet closes with a clear midnight. We've commented on the way that Whitman loves to close these clusters with a powerful uh, set of lines, usually brief. Excellent little coda of four lines, a strain appropriate to his concluding group, Songs of Parting, which of course follows. Now finally, how are we going to approach this collection? Well, first, we will move from mental and intellectual quests to increasingly spiritual quests, which will make sense if you think about the fact that the final poems, 128 poems of Leaves of Grass, all have something to do with the fact that Whitman knows that soon he must meet his Beowulf's dragon of Beowulf Part Three, as we've said, that is to say, his, his end. We will notice 
back to our understanding of Taoism and the yin yang symbol, that idea of opposites, we're going to see a lot of reconciliation, opposition and then reconciliation, paradoxes and then reconciliation. For example, noon, think of it as the height of a career. Uh, night, think of it obviously as the end of a career. There is this one continued serious focus on time. Um, we're going to uh, see again and again Whitman's kind of coming to terms with the fact that he recognizes he doesn't have as much time remaining because of illness that he sustained after, of course, his nurse nursing work, go back to wound dresser and our comments there and drum taps, after the four years of the war. There's as well a lot of concerns about the role of technology. Locomotive will be one of these poems that come to mind, and the role of technology in society. There is, of course, still a love and an appreciation of nature, which is why the transcendentalists love this collection of 22 poems. There is as well, of course, still a political focus. Whitman is always working with that tension between the one and the many and how he defines democracy or liberty or freedom or equality or justice. And then finally, as we mentioned when we talked about our Big Five, the theodicy question, I believe, stands behind every one of these poems that try to bring about the paradox and the reconciliation of the paradoxes. We're still trying to understand especially the horrors of the war. Why did it have to happen? And why is it that war is necessary for peace? Well, we'll turn now to the first of the 22 in the collection from Noon to Starry Night, and I hope that we'll be blown away one more time by what it is that Whitman is pulling off. Thank you.